So on to Sigmund Freud. We're going to give him somewhat short shrift, I'm afraid, because we only have an hour to talk about Freud, but that's okay. Uh, we can get a fair way through it. Um, he's still persona non grata, I would say, among experimental psychologists and probably clinical psychologists as well, but that seems to me to be very unfair. Um, Freud, Freud is one of those thinkers who, uh, all that's left are his mistakes. And the reason for that is that everything that he discovered or put forward is so entrenched in our culture now that we think it's self-evident. And so everything correct has been assimilated and that just leaves everything that's more or less floating on top to look wrong. And, but Freud is also one of those thinkers who was always wrong in an interesting way. And that's very useful. And so um, I also think that many of the things that he put his finger on that are of, of still disputed, for example, the idea of the Oedipus complex are much more useful than people are willing to um, admit, especially in the clinical realm, because the Oedipal complex, which we'll talk about quite a bit, is actually a, a description of a fairly stable form of familial psychopathology where the child gets trapped within the confines of a family because the relationship with one parent or the other or both is so tight that they can't break beyond it and maybe because of their own inability to move towards independence but more frequently because of uh, what you might describe as a kind of conspiracy between the son and, and the parent or the, the child and the parent uh, that prevents them from moving towards uh, autonomous life and keeps them in a state of essentially a state of childhood dependence Freud said I started my professional activity as a neurologist trying to bring relief to my neurotic patients under the influence of an older friend and by my own efforts I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious and psychic life the role of instinctual urges and so on out of these findings grew a new science psychoanalysis a part of psychology and a new treatment for the neuroses I had to pay heavily for this bit of good luck. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. Resistance was strong and unrelenting. In the end, I succeeded in inquiring pupils and building it up an international psychoanalytic association. But the struggle is not over. He made that recording just shortly before he died. He moved to, to England to escape the Nazis. Um, before Freud, I guess, The mind was, it's complicated because Freud, of course, was not the only person to be thinking along the lines that he thought. Pierre Genet, who was one of his teachers, had originated and started to develop many of the ideas that I would say were popularized by Freud. But the idea of the unconscious mind was not, certainly not as well developed prior to Freud as it became afterwards. And... Before that, I suppose, you might say that insofar as people thought of the mind at all, they, they thought of in philosophical terms, and the mind would be that part of you that's, that you're aware of. Like in the, dark, in the Cartesian sense, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. And it kind of seems in some sense self-evident that you're aware of and have control over the contents of your own mind. But that was what Freud really questioned. And he questioned it deeply. He said, well, first of all, the idea that you're one thing, like one mind, is a dubious idea to begin with because people are full of internal contradictions. And then the idea that your mind is all of one type, it's, it's all of one form, was also very questionable as far as Freud was concerned because you could be fractionated into subcomponents. And, you know, the idea, for example, that your anger or your sexual desire could be an autonomous part of your personality in some sense, that it could overtake you and control you, that's really a Freudian idea. And one of the classic Freudian ideas really is that people are made out of sub-personalities, and those sub-personalities are alive. And that's one of the things I really like about the psychoanalytic thinkers, because even the psychologists who say over the last 30 years or thereabouts, since maybe longer now anyway since the demise of behaviorism as an ideology um, and the admission by psychologists that there were 
There is an active unconscious or many active unconsciouses, which is a better way of thinking about it. Psychologists still really haven't come to terms with the idea in any deep sense that these unconscious processes are living things. You know, they're, when, when psychologists talk, for example, about the cognitive unconscious, they're talking about something that, that they describe in more machine-like with more machine-like metaphors, and that's not reasonable. You, you understand things a lot better if you understand that the subcomponents that make up people, the fragmentary bits of them, and also the biological subsystems that, that are part and parcel of your being, are much more intelligently viewed as personalities. They're, they're kind of unidimensional personalities in some sense, so that, for example, if you're angry, you're nothing but angry. I mean, that's an overstatement, obviously. Or if you're afraid, you're nothing but afraid. Or if you're hungry, you're nothing but hunger. Well, that's certainly true if you get hungry enough, or thirsty, or too hot, or any of those things. You, you kind of collapse to a simpler personality that only has one motivation in mind. And we'll talk a lot as we progress about the grounding of those unidimensional motivational systems in biology. But I'd, I'd have to say that Freud was among the first at least the first to synthesize a coherent theory of this multiplicity and to put it forth while also insisting that much of what was happening to you and inside of you was not immediately accessible to your awareness and it's a very profound it's a very profound discovery um, it means among any among many other things that you can formulate ideas First of all, it means that you can act out things that you don't understand for reasons that you don't understand. It also means that your memory can contain things that's represented in one way, but that can't be understood in another. So, for example, and we, we know this is true because there are independent memory systems. There's an independent memory system for procedures. That's for actions. There's an independent memory system for what you might describe as imagination for for the memory that uses images and then there's a another system that articulates knowledge that's the semantic memory system and it's not obvious at all that the contents of all of those are equivalent and that's why for example you can dream things that you don't know because one of the things you might think is that your dreams watch you act and they watch other people act and then they make a little drama out of that and that drama has information in it but you don't necessarily know what that information is in that you can't describe it consciously right it's it's akin to the piagetian idea that kids can play a game and you can take them away from the game and then they won't know how to describe the rules even though they can play the game and so dreams can contain information that's full of the encoding of behavior that has information in it that you're not consciously aware of and so then you can become consciously aware of that in a kind of a revelation say maybe that's what you do when you become aware of the meaning of a dream or the meaning of a fantasy or something like that and that's all all our ability to think that way in some ways can be traced back to Freud